Dusty Stromer put on some much needed muscle and Caliph Battle is rocking a must have jersey number. We break it all down on today's Locked On Zags podcast. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Happy Monday and welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked on Zags is brought to you by FanDuel. Folks, make every moment more. It's the dog days of summer. The sports are not sporting like we want them to, but this summer FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. All right, folks, it is Mailbag Monday today, the last two segments. We got some great mailbag questions to get to, talking Olympics, talking Mark Few's job security, talking a handful of other fun things here. But we are going to lead the show talking about the roster reveal. The Gonzaga men's basketball roster has been put up on the GoZags website. It was not a big spectacle. It typically is not a big spectacle, but it is an opportunity to take a look at a few potential new things. New walk-ons, although the walk-ons that are on the roster are all players we've covered here on Locked on Zag. So if they're new to you, there's definitely an episode somewhere in the backlog on Locked on Zags that you can go find talking about said players. It is also an opportunity to see jersey numbers, which is something that people always love getting a chance to talk about. Who's wearing what number? Did anybody change their number? What are the newbies doing? Uh, so we'll get to that. And then it also is an opportunity to see any potential changes uh, in, in listed height and weight. And we always kind of take those a little bit with a grain of salt, especially for transfers. Uh, if their weight is different from their previous school, you know, how much is that really an actual specific weight difference? Is it just a difference in scales, various other things like that? But we are going to take a look at, at some of that stuff and how it shook out uh, with Gonzaga's new roster. We'll start with the jersey numbers. We'll start with the far and away most eye-popping unique jersey number that we saw come out of this roster reveal that belongs to Caliph Battle, former Butler guard, former Temple guard, former Arkansas guard. He wore number four at Butler. He wore number zero at Temple. He wore number zero at Arkansas. And now he is going in the exact opposite direction. Battle will wear number 99 for Mark Few and the Gonzaga Bulldogs this year. Uh, there was a rule change recently that allows players to wear numbers uh, at that. Most of the time, the two numbers would be five or lower. So you'd see like 35, maybe you'd see something like 45 or 44, but you wouldn't see a lot of sevens. You wouldn't see, especially like in the teens because of the way the referees have to call it. So they could do seven because it would be like this. But if you were 17, they'd have to do like one seven. I know not all of you are on YouTube, but I'm mimicking the, <laughs> the numbers here. Uh, and now that they've allowed them to do that, you are seeing some more jersey numbers that are uniquer in, in this situation. In fact, Houston Millette, former Pepperdine guard who transferred to Alabama this offseason, he is going to wear number 99 for the Crimson Tide. He's kind of the first player to make headlines for wearing that unique jersey number. Now we have Caliph Battle choosing to wear the same number for the Zags. I'm excited about it. It's fun. Does it really matter? No. But now you can buy jerseys. Now that you can, you can, I mean, you could always buy jerseys, but now that the players can make money off of them, there's NIL opportunities. Wearing a unique jersey number might actually help you a little bit. People might want to wear, like, honestly, if we're thinking about just like cool aesthetic jerseys in Gonzaga history, especially if you can include the last name, which hasn't always been the case, a jersey that says Battle 99 on the back, it's pretty dope, right? I mean, 99, first year the Zags made the tournament, of course, or first year of the streak that the Gonzaga is currently on. A jersey that says Battle 99 with Gonzaga on the front, that's going to sell. That's going to sell. Hopefully, Caleb gets a good chunk of that because he deserves it for choosing to wear this number. He didn't really control having a dope last name, but that's the reality of the situation, and he's rocking with it, and I dig it. Uh, other New Jersey numbers, much more, uh, for lack of a better word, normal, I guess. Mike Lajai is wearing number one. It's the same jersey number he wore at Pepperdine if it ain't broke. Don't fix it. Same, well, not not quite same with Braden Smith. Braden Smith was wearing number two uh, in his two seasons at Colgate. He is switching to number three, a very prominent number in Gonzaga basketball history. Of course, Adam Morrison being very well known for wearing number three. Uh, now it'll go to Braden Smith. Emmanuel Inocente is going to wear number five for Gonzaga. He wore number nine last year in his freshman season at Tarleton State. 
Uh, and then the freshman, Ismaila Diani, is going to wear number 24. For Gonzaga, the two walk-ons, Cade Orness, is going to wear number 7. And then Noah Holland, another walk-on who joined the team. His father played on the team back in the 90s, I believe. He's from Idaho, junior college guy. He is going to wear number 35 for Gonzaga this upcoming season. Those are your New Jersey numbers. Some new size difference stuff, and I pulled this off of a tweet from the great Theo Lawson of the Spokesman Review. He said that Graham E.K. is listed as 10 pounds heavier than he was last year. And I'm intrigued by this because it's not like the website is listing whether that's 10 pounds of muscle, whether that is 10 pounds of not muscle, uh, what that, what, you know, whether they're using a different scale. Like there's a lot of things that, again, uh, you take this with a grain of salt. I don't know how much it really means, how much it really matters. If Graham E.K. put on 10 more, ma- more pounds of muscle, that is an objectively good thing. This dude is already insanely strong. He is an absolute powerhouse. He is a load on the block. If he is 10 pounds stronger, that is a huge, huge benefit for Gonzaga, his ability to score around the rim, to body up to guys like Mitchell Saxon when you're in conference play, uh, non-conference play to be able to body up with some of the bigs that they're going to end up facing. Uh, in my head, I rolled through UConn and UCLA, and I was like, well, a Dembona and Donovan Klingon are not there. Uh, you'll see Samson Johnson uh, for UConn. He's a, he's a solid big. A Mara is a big, big for UCLA. He's not a super uh, strong guy, though, so I think Graham will be able to move him around a little bit. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a good thing. Obviously, if it slows him down a little bit, that could be something to monitor. It's also possible some of this is just a little added weight in the offseason, and he's gonna it's going to slim right back down by the time we get into the regular season, which, again, is why – These numbers may not mean all that much. I also want to focus on two others, though, because I think that there is the possibility for this to be relevant. That is Braden Huff and Dusty Stromer, who are both listed at eight pounds heavier. We've talked a lot about Dusty Stromer and the need to gain weight, or I should say the need to put on muscle. doesn't need to just gain weight just to gain weight. Uh, Getting stronger is is a big thing for Dusty Stromer. He came in very thin. Uh, we knew that that was just the frame that he had in high school. It's nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. It wasn't an issue necessarily. It was just one of those things of like, hey, for Dusty to reach the potential, for him to be the three and D wing that we want him to be in college, and certainly for him to be able to be not only a defender in the NBA but just an NBA player. Period. He's going to need to get stronger. It's not a a secret. It's not even really a knock on him. It's just like, hey, this is something that you're going to need to do, and this is the time to do it. College is the best time to, you know, it, just from a from a body physiology perspective, it's a good time to gain weight. It's a good time to get stronger. Your body is still malleable. You can still do that. So I think for him, gaining eight pounds is a, is a promising sign. Again, I haven't seen pictures of him outside of the few we see on Instagram. It's hard to, to really fully gauge if there's a dramatic difference. You know, we saw Ben Gregg, who I don't know that his measurements changed all that much between, I think, his freshman year and his sophomore year. But we saw him and we're like, oh, wow. He got a lot stronger, more chiseled, like you could tell his physique changed. I don't know if that's the case with Dusty Stromer yet. We'll probably get a better sense around craziness in the kennel at what that looks like. But if he's stronger, if he's more physical, if he's able to kind of hold his own against bigger guards and wings, that's a huge benefit for Gonzaga. They're going to need him to be able to fill that kind of role, and I think that's promising. Same with Braden Huff. Now, Braden Huff's speed and agility is kind of one of the few knocks on him, so gaining weight, not necessarily a bad thing if he's stronger, but we want to make sure he's not losing any any speed, any ability to get up and down the floor because Gonzaga likes to get up and down the floor. And if Braden Huff's on the floor and he's not able to kind of keep up in that way or not able to play big minutes because of that, that's going to limit his, his ability to overall be impactful, could limit the certain lineups that he might end up being in as well. Uh, they also list Michael Jai as being eight pounds heavier. Uh, again, coming from Pepperdine, I take that with a grain of salt. I don't know if he's going to look a lot different or if he's going to be a lot different physically. Uh, eight pounds is is enough that it could just be a, a difference in scales and things like that, too. So I, I don't know that they, I would read too much into that, but just wanted to make sure to report it as well. And then last here, before we get into the mailbag questions, uh, wanted to kind of do a quick roster breakdown. Haven't done this in a while. And just while looking through the roster, it was pretty easy to pull this data. Where everybody's from? You know, Gonzaga's always had a unique a spread of where their talent comes from. And this year is kind of, it's more focused in the state of Washington than it is traditionally. Part of that is walk-on related. So I think that again is something that doesn't, you know, if we were to take the walk-ons out, it would spread it out a little bit more. But for Washington, there are six players on Gonzaga's roster from the state of Washington. That's Michael Ajayi, Steele Venters, Braden Smith, Kate Orness, Joe Few, and then of course, Nolan Hickman. So you have two walk-ons, you have one 
peer recruit out of high school. And then you have three transfers all from the state of Washington. Just kind of an interesting breakdown there. Two players from California. That's Dusty Stromer, of course, a recruit. And then Joaquin Reyes Moore, who was a walk on on the team last year, who's still on the team this year as well. So six from Washington, two from California, the other one's from the United States, one from Colorado and Graham E.K., one from Oregon and Ben Gregg, one from Illinois in Braden Huff, one from Idaho, that's Noah Halan, the walk-on, and then one from New Jersey, that is, of course, Caliph Battle, and then international four players from the international ranks for Gonzaga this year. Uh, Ryan Nemphart, of course, from Ontario, Canada. Uh, Emmanuel Inocente is initially from Italy. Jun suk Yo, of course, from South Korea. And then from Senegal, Ismaila Diane. That is your roster breakdown for the Zags in terms of where they are from heading into this upcoming season. Folks, is there a reality where Mark Few ever ends up on the college basketball hot seat? And how quickly might that happen to his successor? We got more on that coming up in just a second. Right after I tell you all about today's sponsor, FanDuel. I love sports. You love sports. That's why you're listening to a sports podcast in July. We love them so much that we never want them to stop. But in the dog days of summer, we get fewer games. The sports, they're not sportsing like we want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. And if you want to watch the Olympics with a vested interest, Team USA right now down to minus 400 odds to win the gold medal. Canada is at plus 1,000. For those interested, we'll talk a little bit more about my Olympic predictions later in the show. Head over to FanDuel.com. Start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, folks, segment two, still any Patton, still Locked On Zags podcast. And we are starting our Mailbag Monday portion of the show. I want to give a shout out to my sister show, Locked On College Basketball. Many of you are listeners to both Locked On Zags and Locked On College Basketball. I sincerely appreciate those of you who make lots of time out of your day and week to listen to me talk college hoops. Uh, this next question involves the Locked On College Basketball Show, so I just want to shout it out. Go check it out. It is on any platform you find Locked On Zags. Myself, co-host Isaac Shade of Locked On Tar Heels, fantastic resource for all things college hoops. This next question comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, your Locked On College Basketball Show on Friday discussed coaches on the hot seat. Is there anything Mark Few could do or not do to end up on the coaching hot seat? After Mark Few, if the next head coach starts losing in the NCAA tournament first round or fails to make the tournament, how quickly would that coach find himself on the hot seat? And how long do you think they'd remain the head coach if Gonzaga were to start missing the tournament? Yeah, Friday's episode, Locked On College Basketball, we did one coach in each of the high majors who was on the hot seat. Uh, talked a little bit Mike Woodson at Indiana. Talked a little bit about Kyle Neptune at Villanova. Uh, some fun conversations there for those of you who like following the coaching carousel. What jobs might end up being open this next offseason? Obviously did not talk Mark Few. And that's because I think we're at a point where Mark Few will never be on the hot seat. I don't see it happening. There is... It would be a, a, an absolute stunner for Gonzaga to even consider firing him. Part of that is because I think if Gonzaga were to like crater off of a cliff, which has yet to happen and seems very unlikely to happen, uh, Mark Few would probably quit before it would get to the point where he would they would have to make a decision to fire him because he would get he would get a very long leash. One bad year, no chance. Two bad years, very unlikely. A third bad year at that point, and and it would be bad years, like not just like oh they. Uh, they made the tournament all three years, but they lost in the first round or they were only, you know, they were an 11 seed one of the years or whatever like that. It's like three straight years of missing the tournament. I'd be stunned if Mark Few was still coaching. Like, I think he would leave at that point. So I don't think Mark Few is ever going to end up on the hot seat. As for his replacement, yeah, it kind of depends what direction they go. It depends the timing. There's a lot of factors here. If, if Mark Few leaves at the absolute peak like right around now, if he leaves when this team is still in the Sweet 16 streak, when they're still, you know, landing high level recruits, still a huge player in the transfer portal, and they replace him with Brian Michelson. Let's say that happens. B Mike is good. He's going to have to keep the level pretty high. He would go on the, on the hot seat much faster than Mark Few, but I still think the team would give him a decent leash. Because if, if the system's still the same, if they're still running the same stuff, they're still recruiting similarly, like, yeah, if there's a drop-off, I think you still keep him around. It would have to be a fairly dramatic drop-off. Whereas I think if they were to hire externally, that coach would have a much shorter leash. 
I've mentioned Leon Rice a handful of times just because I think there's a logical connection there. If Gonzaga brings in Leon Rice from Boise State and Leon Rice keeps bringing the Zags to the tournament but keeps failing to win, which is the big knock on him, he hasn't won an NCAA tournament game uh, since being the head coach at Boise State, even though he's made it a bunch of times. I don't think Gonzaga puts up with with losing in the first round of the NCAA tournament multiple times from Leon Rice. Like maybe they put up with it twice and then he's gone. And 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 at the, the, again, there's a lot of factors here. Gonzaga is not going to be able to spend the millions and millions of dollars that the Kentuckys and the Yukons uh, and the Dukes and, and et cetera can pay up for a coach. So they're going to be a little bit more stringent, which means they're probably not going to want to keep cycling through coaches. Ultimately, it's kind of hard to predict how Gonzaga would handle a coaching search because they haven't had to do it since they were anywhere close to being at this profile as a program. So I don't know how a coaching search would look. It's hard to know how much outside interest there would be in head coaching at Gonzaga because it is a smaller school. It is a smaller resource school, but it is obviously a high profile, successful program primarily because of their coach. So I think there's just a lot. It's it's such a unique program to think about, like how it would rank in terms of desirable jobs for coaches and the amount of money Gonzaga would be able to spend on a coach is a huge factor here that is kind of unknown. I don't see Gonzaga wanting to keep things out of the family. And I think if they're able to promote internally with Brian Michelson or bring Tommy Lloyd back, I think they would give that coach a very long leash because they want to keep things kind of in that Mark Few coaching tree uh, if and when he eventually decides to leave. Next question here comes from Pete uh, underscore 22909 on Discord, who says, what are your predictions for the gold, silver, and bronze medal team winners in men's basketball at the Paris Olympics? Who will be named the FIBA MVP, and what players will make the all-tournament team? Yeah, let's get some predictions out there here. We're about a week out from the opening ceremonies and the start of the 2024 Olympic Games. Gold medals, Team USA, they're still the heavy favorites. They still should be the heavy favorites. I know people were panicked about their near loss to Sedan. Uh, they needed a bit of a wake-up call. They got it. And I think that we're still seeing Steve Kerr and the coaching staff, which includes Mark Few, uh, tinkering with lineups, playing, uh, you know, kind of the whole bench unit, the same amount of minutes as the starters. That will be different when they get into the actual Olympics. I'm not really worried about Team USA. I, I think they're going to win gold. Silver and bronze, I went silver for France and bronze for Canada. I would love to see Canada medal. Obviously, the Kelly Olenek and Andrew Nembhard connection, Connor Griffin on the coaching staff over there as well. This is the best year. I think it's the best opportunity for the Canadians to medal. They have an incredibly talented roster. They have Shai Gilgis Alexander, Jamal Murray, Lou Dort. Uh, they, Dylan Brooks is playing great. Obviously, Olenek and Nembhard, as we mentioned, uh, RJ Barrett. This is a really good Canada roster. I still have France over them. France has a good combination of veterans and younger guys. Victor Weminyama and Rui Gobert is just a, an incredible defensive front court. I think that's going to help them a ton. Uh, they got some veteran guys like Nick Batum and Evan Fournier on that roster. I think they're going to be very solid. Uh, in terms of FIBA MVP, this is a bit of a wild card. Give me Anthony Davis. He has been the best player for Team USA in the scrimmages. He is a switchable defender, which is really valuable in FIBA style play. He is scoring the basketball really well. He looks great. He looks great. I think it would be fun for him and his legacy to cement being the best player for a gold medal Team USA team. That is a huge boost for what is already an incredible career for him. Uh, would be fun to see Anthony Davis be able to take home that kind of uh, accolade, especially on a roster like this. I picked 10 players for the all-tournament team. I don't know exactly how they do it. I picked five from my winning team, Team USA. I picked three uh, from the second place team, France, and I picked two from Canada. My five Americans for the Team USA all-tournament team would be Anthony Davis, of course, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, and Anthony Edwards. For France, I already mentioned two of them, Victor Weminyama and Rudy Gobert. I also went to Nando Decolo, who has been really good for France uh, in the exhibition games. I think he's going to be their leading scorer outside of Wemby. Uh, and I think if this team medals, he certainly could be in that conversation. And then for the Can Canadians, Shai Gilgus Alexander is their best player and one of the best players on the planet. And then, you know what? Let's just do it. Give me Kelly Olenek. He's been great. He was great against France in a scrimmage game. He had, I think, 14 points on six of seven shooting. He's looked excellent. He's their captain. If they medal, I would love to see Kelly get an opportunity to win or to be on an all-tournament team for FIBA. Final question of the segment here comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, Gonzaga has three NCAA tournament streaks. They've made every tournament since 1998, a run of 26 years and counting. They've won at least one game in every tournament since 2008, a run of 16 years and counting. And they've made the Sweet 16 every year since 2015, a run of nine years and counting. Which one of these three is the most impressive or are all equally impressive? 
This is a great question because I think it's it's easy to point to the most difficult one, which is the Sweet 16 streak, as the most uh, as the best one, as the most impressive streak. And I think I probably would lean in that direction, but it's not quite as clear cut because making the Sweet 16 is, is obviously harder than making the NCAA tournament, but is making the Sweet 16 nine years in a row harder than making the NCAA tournament 26 years in a row? And then in the middle, I mean, not losing a game in the first round since 2008, that one blows me away. I started at Gonzaga as a freshman in 2009. My first year was a loss to Syracuse in the second round. Andy Routens went nuclear against the Zags in that game, and they didn't adjust their defense. It was brutal. That feels like a lifetime ago. And Gonzaga, in my my real fandom following the Zags, has never lost in the first round of the NCAA tournament. When you think about the, the titanic programs that have lost in the first round, Kentucky, they're doing it all the dang time. Duke's done it. Kansas has done it. Like Everybody has done this, and Gonzaga has not. So to me, I do go, it's it's hard because at the same time, not even missing the NCAA tournament in over two decades, insane. All of these are incredibly impressive. I'm going to say it's the Sweet 16 because being one of the, the final 16 teams for an entire straight decade is just unprecedented. It is unbelievable. So I'm going to go with that. But I do think all three of these are very e close to equally impressive. And I think there is a strong argument that any of them could be considered the toughest or the most impressive. Now, right, folks, we're going to close out the show determining if the Blazers could be a fit for both or either Drew Timmy or Killian Tilly. Also, Jeremy Pargo, he's doing what with his career right now? We're going to talk about that in just a second. All right, folks, segment three, still Andy Patton, still Locked on Zags podcast. We're still talking through Mailbag Monday here as we get into the latter part of July, a week out from the Olympic Games. This question here comes from Michael via Instagram. Michael says, Blazers have an open two-way spot. Could Killian Tilly or Drew Timmy be a fit? I know you love having your Zags in Portland. I sure do. And, folks, if either Drew Timmy or Killian Tilly, even if they just played a preseason game for the Blazers, if they suit up, in a Rip City jersey, I am I am buying it as soon as possible. Those are two of my favorite Zags of all time. I absolutely adore them. Many of you know my dog is named Tilly after Killian Tilly. I am currently in the process of collecting Drew Timmy basketball cards at a furious pace. Uh, those are two of my absolute favorite guys. And if they ended up on my favorite NBA team, oh man, that would be a dream come true for me. Uh, speaking just candidly about Portland's roster, Drew Timmy's not really a fit. We've had conversations on the show about believing that Drew Timmy does deserve a shot in the NBA and that he has more versatility to his offensive game than he gets credit for. Uh, but ultimately, the, the issue is that Portland has two very large kind of, I don't want to say lumbering, but two big centers. One of them is a, I mean, the, both of them are young. It's DeAndre Ayton and then Donovan Klingon, who they just selected this year. They don't need a third center, traditional big center like Drew Timmy on a roster with those two guys. It just doesn't make sense. Drew Timmy in Rip City with the remix playing at the Child Center would be amazing. Drew Timmy on a two-way contract, I, I don't think it's like defensively bad for Portland or anything like that, but I don't see it being the direction they would utilize that spot for. They don't really need more depth there. They have some other, Duop Reith is their third string center. He's a pretty solid player. So I think they're probably good on Drew Timmy. And I think personally, as much as I love Drew and would love to see him in Portland selfishly, uh, he's got a better chance of sticking in the NBA somewhere else. However, Killian Tilly, pretty logical fit, actually, in Portland. I think this makes a lot of sense. They're trying to deal Jeremy Grant. We'll see if they trade Jeremy Grant this year or if they wait a little bit longer. They don't need to trade him as much as the national media makes it seem like, oh, they got to get Jeremy Grant out of Portland. Like they, they have to stay above the minimum luxury tax or the minimum salary. Jeremy Grant's taken up a bunch of their money. He's not overpaid for his position. Like there's not really a, a dire need to trade Jeremy Grant. But eventually they'll want to move on from him. They have some depth at the four, but it's it's a bit questionable. Jabari Walker is decent. Uh, Chris Murray has been a bit of a bust so far after taking him last year. Chumani Kamara was, was great as a rookie last year, but he's kind of more of a three. So a stretch four who can space the floor, give Scoot Henderson more room to operate uh, as a driver to the basket, honestly makes a lot of sense. Tilly also has 54 games of NBA experience, so you're getting somebody who's already done it before. I really like the fit. Yes, I am biased. I will not pretend for a single second that I'm not biased. If you want a less biased opinion on the Blazers, check out Locked On Blazers, Mike G. Rich. My boy, my guy, I love Michael. He does an awesome job with the Locked On Blazers podcast. Definitely check it out if you have not done so yet. 
Next two questions here. This one comes from Adam via Gmail. He says, I attended the big three at the Moda Center today. To my surprise, Jeremy Pargo was playing. His team lost 51-46, but Pargo led all scorers with 24. Led his team in points, rebounds, and assists. Was the go-to guy. Uh, I don't know if there are any other Zags playing in the league. Do you know? Yeah, this is fun. Uh, I, I looked up through all the big three rosters, which was an absolute blast of a first thing to do on my Monday morning. There's some really fun names on those rosters. For those of you who don't know, it's a three-on-three tournament. It's a league started by Ice Cube. Uh, just a, a lot of kind of older former NBA players playing in this league. Uh, it's a competitive three-on-three three on three league. It's it's not super popular yet, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm glad Adam here got a chance to go and, and see Jeremy Pargo go out and ball out. He was on the team triplets team. Uh, his brother was on the team, Gennaro Pargo, who was also an NBA player. So you have the two Pargos. You also had Jamario Moon, who played in the NBA, Jeff Ayers, who played briefly in the NBA, and Joe Johnson, who's absolutely incredible incredible NBA player, one of the most prolific scorers in basketball history. Lisa Leslie is their coach. That was one of the fun things to see. Uh, so many elite legends coaching in this league. Gary Payton's a coach. Uh, Dr. J is a coach. Rick Barry is a coach. Charles Oakley, tons of elite former NBA players in the coaching ranks. Uh, there was no other former Zags playing. I didn't notice any other former WCC players playing as well. Some of the names I did catch, Michael Beasley, Mario Chalmers, Leandro Barbosa, Glenn Rice Jr., Greg Monroe, Nick Swaggy P. Young, a handful of others. Definitely go check it out if you haven't. Uh, if you're if you're in the area where they're playing, go check out a game. It's fun. It's good stuff. Plus, you might get to see former Zag Jeremy Pargo balling out. Final question of the show here. This one comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says the Gonzaga women have played in the past five NCAA tournaments and seven of the past nine with two Sweet 16 appearances. However, they have not been nearly as successful getting power conference teams on the schedule other than the annual Stanford game and one or two power conference teams in an MTE. Why could it be that the Gonzaga women have a harder time getting power conference teams on the schedule? He has a lot of potential reasons. I'm also not sure how much of a priority it is. I think that's a big thing here. It doesn't feel like are the women like desperately trying to get more high profile games and failing and struggling to do so. I don't really get that sense. They schedule a lot of really good mid-major non-conference teams. Like that's not an area that they have struggled. They get a lot of really good teams on the schedule. Their non-conference strength of schedule is particularly solid. Uh, last year, in, in addition to Stanford and their MTE, they also had Arizona Cal and Washington State. So it's not, you know, they had more than just Stanford and the MTE. Uh, but I think a big part of it is pretty simple. Women's teams don't travel as much in the non-conference schedule as men's teams do. It is likely a budgetary reason. I don't know specifically at Gonzaga, but it's a, probably a budgetary reason at all programs. So you're not seeing, you know, Gonzaga take on a, a Big East team in New York like the men's team is doing this year. You're not seeing, you know, a neutral site game being played at uh, the, you know, the, the Sanford Pentagon in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. You're not seeing, you know, games... You're just you're not seeing as much of that. Again, it's not just at Gonzaga. Most other programs, if you look at their non-conference schedules, geographically, they're far more likely to be very close quarters as opposed to on the men's side where often you see it be a lot more spread out. So I think it's kind of just as simple as that. I mean, again, look at the Arizona Cal Wazoo. Those were the three and Stanford. Those are the four power five non-conference games Gonzaga played last year outside of their MTE. All pretty regional, all pretty local. They played some other good teams. They played South Dakota State. They played Rice. They played some other New Mexico. Uh, and Rice is a little bit farther away. But for the most part, they don't, they don't play a lot of uh, far away teams. And I think that's just kind of a, a truth of women's basketball of where it's at right now. And I think part of the reason for Gonzaga. Now, obviously, the women's team would love to have a more challenging non-conference slate because – their strength of schedule in conference is even weaker than Gonzaga's is on the men's side. Uh, and now with Washington State and Oregon State joining, that helps. Obviously, both those rosters got gutted pretty significantly by the transfer portal. Uh, Oregon State in particular was a really good team last year, and basically everybody left, and that really sucks for Oregon State. It sucks for Gonzaga and the WCC to, to lose a lot of that talent before that team comes into the conference. But by and large, those two teams are still going to help elevate the, the level of the conference slate for Gonzaga, and hopefully they can uh, pick up a few great games in the non conference uh, and really build up a, a quality schedule heading into what should be another exciting year for Lisa 48 and the Zags. It's going to wrap it up for us, for me today here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Folks, thank you so much for making this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. Thank you to the everyday listeners. Thank you to those of you on our Discord channel. If you haven't done so yet, join. It's free. This is where you ask mailbag questions. There's a whole section where you can ask a mailbag question. I'll scoop them up, throw them in the notes, get them in the show on Mondays. Definitely check that out if you have not done so yet. We'll be back later this week. 
We'll wrap up summer league coverage. We'll talk recruiting as we get updates in that space. We'll also get you ready for the Olympics, ready for the Zags participating in the Olympics, whether it's Yvonne, Philip, Rui, uh, the two Canadians, of course, Coach Mark Few, all sorts of fun stuff happening here on Locked on Zags. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, as always, go Zags.